Okay, we're here at the uh, Pasadena Book Fair, which is uh, February 2014. Book Fair being sponsored by the Southern California chapter of ABAA. And our next interview is with Mark Heim, uh, owner, creator, and founder of Bibliotopus. And Mark, I'm gonna ask you, like I ask everybody, what your background is. Family, uh, siblings, uh, education, etc. Well, I was born in Los Angeles. I went to school. My dad was in the jewelry business in Beverly Hills. And uh, I actually worked for my dad during Christmas vacations and summer vacations. And he had vir virtually every film industry celebrity was his customers. Mm. So I had a chance to meet them all from that era. I'm talking the 50s and 60s. Uh, they didn't care much about meeting me. I mean, it was nothing. It was just yeah. the owner's kid. little brat kid, you know, even though I was working there and waiting on people occasionally and all that. Um, and it was, I was indifferent too, pretty much. I mean, after you've seen a hundred, you know, it, it's not so exciting. But it gave me an interesting background in dealing with a certain kind of person at the retail level. And it gave me a certain appreciation on the buy side of buying jewels and uh, manufactured jewelry also, which served me a little bit well as a baseline when I became a bookseller. How old were you at, at this period when you were... Well, I worked for my dad pretty much from the time I was about 12 until the time I was about 23 or 24. Really? Well into the 60s, it, off and on, school, usually when I wasn't in school. And uh, so the high school, college, did not graduate from college. What was your major or did you have one? History. Okay. Um, I did very well in English. Uh, but I think it was because I was lucky enough to have teachers that in, indulged or appreciated creative writing over, let's say, the mastery of grammar, uh, right. which I was not very good at. <laughs> but um, I was uh, freed up enough to write with my own speaking voice so I could get it down on paper pretty easily. And came out of school, worked full-time for my dad for a couple of years, and then as the 60s were winding down, uh, I had a girlfriend at the time, and we, she'd also, uh, was a local, had also been born and raised in Los Angeles, and we were both living in Beverly Hills at that point. Um, we looked around and we concluded that the Cultural Revolution had happened, and furthermore, that the political revolution was not going to happen. And this is 69, yep. 70. Yep. We started to see some of our friends dying, and we saw others who were identified with um, delusional political aims. <laughs> and we thought it would be good if we could get out of the city get away from all that, you know, kind of separate ourselves from what was going on. And so we traveled around Southern California. We went to the deserts, we went to the beaches, we went to the mountains looking for a place to live. We settled on the mountains. It was a little cheaper than the beaches yeah. and a little more um, inviting than the desert, particularly the summer times, even though it snowed in the winter. And we found this little place, Idlewild, about halfway up the tallest mountain in Southern California, which is Mount San Jacinto. It's 10,700 feet. It's a little, mostly national park. Most of the mountains national park or state park. It was a little tiny community of 2,000 people about halfway up the mountain. We liked it. It was, in, it was way off the beaten track, but we were still kind of 125 miles from LA so we could visit our parents and all that. Got a house, got married, started having babies, and at that point, started to think about how can we make a living in Idlewild? And we <laughs> looked <good> around <laughs> Idlewild and we thought, oh, 
all, even if we have all the money in Idlewild, it's going to be hard to live on. It's mostly lumberjacks and uh, um, Just palmists and astrologers, <laughs> you know, they're real estate people. So uh, the first thing I tried, which is the logical default for all people in such circumstances, is write a, either write a novel or write a movie script. So I went for write a movie script, but I didn't understand the discipline. I just knew how to write. So I wrote this movie script, and I knew where I was going with it. I had the whole thing worked out in my head, but when I got done with it, it was two inches thick and would have run six and a half hours on film. <laughs> At that point, there'd only been one, maybe two miniseries that had been done. Yeah. And that's what this would work, would work for. Yeah. So I took my, I worked on it for a couple of years, and took it into Hollywood and shopped it. And uh, someone, most people looked at it and just said, it's impossible. I mean, first of all, it was set in 1575, so it was costumes and you know, all, yeah, that. all that. But in addition, the length, there was just no way to chop it. And it was, uh, but someone had a vision that it would work as a miniseries and paid us $10,000 for a three-month option. That's what we sold them. Now, $10,000 to us, and this is in 1974, was huge just money. We were... That. We had a three-bedroom house at the end of a cul-de-sac that was wonderful, all glass. We were paying $250 a month for it. $10,000 <laughs> was an outrageous amount of money. So we took the $10,000, and the guy called up and said, uh, about a week later, called up and said, oh, come to a meeting. Okay, got my car, drove down to L.A., went to this meeting, couldn't believe what I was listening to. The idiots saying, really things that had made no sense at all and <laughs> two hours of it and I said okay thanks I got my car came home and the next time he called for a meeting I said no no more meetings done that doesn't come yeah. with it you didn't buy meetings I ain't ever going to one of those again and I said can't make a movie if you don't come to meetings movies cannot be made without meetings that's the way it's done in Hollywood hmm. and I said I'm out of the movie business hmm. and three months later I got my thing back and we started pondering again. What can we sell off the mountain? Because we, there wasn't enough money in the mountain. What is the most expensive thing per pound that's normally sold by mail? And we would have opted for postage stamps, but postage stamps were sold in mostly sold in stamp stores over the counter, right. or coins. But they were in those days sold in coin stores over the counter, not at auction like they are today. Right. And the next thing up was books, which were a couple of pounds a piece, and but those were normally sold by catalog. Yes, people had bookshops, but many, many booksellers put out catalogs so they could have access to a wider customer base. They could sell to anybody in the US or in Europe, it's at least English speaking, if they put out a catalog. And many, many booksellers did, and we said, well, this is something we can do from Idlewild. So, and it was, you know, it wasn't, any romantic love of literature or anything that drove us to the book business, it was the most expensive thing per pound that's normally yeah. sold by mail. That's us. <laughs> you know, we'll go for that. Okay. Okay. So it began, I started by collecting, you know, buying books and reading, getting, getting as many catalogs as I could, figuring out if there was a wrinkle in there that I could play. And six years later, I did six years as a collector and became a bookseller. What year was that? 1980, I put out my first catalog. Right. So I was collecting from 74 to 80, and then catalog one was in 1980. Who were some of the uh, people who influenced you or acted as perhaps mentors for you? Uh, you seem to have no formal background in, bo in books. You sort of just decided one day to be a collector. Were there people who influenced you uh, along the way? I learned more about what not to do than what to do. I did have, I did see a bookshop in operation, let's say. I mean, in Los Angeles, I could go to the Heritage Bookshop, for yeah. example, and see what it looked like from the outside. I couldn't see the man behind the curtain, you know, the details of how they were producing stock or what they were doing. And from catalogs, I could learn Right. Depending on whose catalog it was, you know, there are basic. There are six basics in every catalog with every entry. 
author, I mean, th theoretically it's a yeah. book, author, title, place, date, a bibliographical conclusion, which could be as simple as first edition, right, and a physical description. Those, and it, that could be as simple as fine. Now, and I realized that that's the basics. You can do that and you can do no more and you can call yourself a bookseller and put out if you've got right. the books and people and a price. Yeah. You know, hang a price. In fact, some people put out catalogs that don't have prices. Yeah. They say, call and ask us for the true. price, you, you know, like, uh, yeah, sure. you know, <laughs> what yeah. do you do? You yeah. call them and say, hey, this is your cousin. What's the best <laughs> price? price? Yeah, right. You know. Okay, so then I noticed some booksellers gave collations, mostly the people who sold the older books right. and were more scholarly and more academic. They would give a collation. So I figured out I had to learn how to collate a book, what that all meant. And that wasn't really that hard to learn. I mean, yeah. the easily deduced, if you have someone's collation and you have a copy of the book that matches that collation, da, 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 back and forth, right. and you can figure out how to collate it. Oh, okay, that means that. Oh, that means that. Oh, I see, they do that when they don't have this. Yes. All right. And then there were dealers who who in their catalogs then spoke. Gabe spoke about the bibliographical complications, spoke about the author, spoke about the times in which the book was set, spoke about the variables of the rarity. Oh, this book doesn't have a faded spine or this book isn't rebacked or this copy is not an ex-library copy or whatever it was. There are various things that people chose in one entry or another, and I said, okay, that's good. Got that. Now that's what's possible. And, uh, and then there was the format of the catalog. So how people laid out a catalog, what typeface they used, whether they had pictures, what, what they did that was, why do I find this catalog attractive, and why do I find this catalog difficult to read? Mm -hmm. And how are people going to access this catalog? And is there, I ask myself questions like, is there a way I can get people to actually read the whole catalog rather than just go for an, an author they like and stop and read it? Or an author, a title, nope, not that title, next author, that title, okay, I'll read that one, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. These were all things that concerned me. And also um, what I observed. Now, influences. Before I became a bookseller, they all influenced me. Right. Every one of them. A science fiction catalog from Lloyd Curry had as much impact on me as a first editions catalog from uh, Maurice Neville uh, or a um, uh, uh, catalog of esoterica and science from Michael Goth at the Globe Bookstore. It was a local guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, but anyone I could get. Now, it was harder for me to access the people who were selling science and early printing. I looked, but I knew that wasn't my game. At least it couldn't be my game initially. I didn't understand how they calculated demand. I knew how to calculate demand for novels. Uh, it was easy. You could kind of feel it. Mm -hmm. Also, fiction um, in the 70s was a rising market. And there was an interesting moment in the 70s when I was collecting that the 20th century books were cheap and were the entry level. In other words, I recognized that people who were not collectors, who aspired to become collectors, they very often read the books that they grew up with, mm -hmm. very often 20th century books, uh, they had more impact on their life. Sure, they read Dickens and they read Jane Austen and they read Shakespeare, but the books that they mm, were magnetized to were um, 20th century books. And those were very inexpensive, or relatively inexpensive compared to older books. They hadn't kind of come on yet. Yeah. And unless they were inscribed copies or important presentation copies or great association copies or particular rarities, and very often the rarest ones were obscure ones where the major novels that people wanted were, had been produced in larger numbers. So 
the process in the 70s with people would start by collecting modern firsts, what they called, and that you could buy in those days, I don't know, Grapes of Wrath, perfect for $75. Mm -hmm. And Old Man in the Sea, perfect for $35. And frankly, you could buy The Sun Also Rises for five or $600. This is in the 70s. Yeah. Maximum, and if you were lucky, you could get it for $200. Same for Gatsby. And Catcher in the Rye was $75 or yeah. $50, and Lolita was $25 or $50. I mean, these books were inexpensive. Even The Lord of the Rings was under $1,000. Yeah. It was a scarce book. Okay, it was maybe $300 for a Lord of the Rings. Nice right. set. The good old so days. So you could, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> there are a number of secrets for being happy, and one of them is to repeat the mantra, these are the good old days. Mm. Um, anyway, I noticed that. I wanted to do a mix. I wanted my books to go from, you know, Homer. I realize Homer is poetry, but I saw it as, you know, the, my general definition of fiction went from Homer to whatever was in the 60s in those days, to kill a mockingbird or mm. Dune or Catch-22 or whatever. So. I, obviously, I couldn't afford incunables, but um, but that was where I was thinking. And so those early books, King Arthur, let's say, okay, there's one known copy of the first edition of King Arthur, and there's one known copy of the second edition of King Arthur. I'm not going to get that book. So when it came to King Arthur, I had to either buy an illustrated edition that was by an, uh, an illustrator that was in high demand or some other version of it if I wanted to have that book. Um, anyway, that's what I did. I assembled. So, and in the process of assembling and uh, buying the books, that's when I found booksellers would talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> and if I kind of knew what I wanted, then I didn't need to hear them. I did learn how they try to sell books, obviously, because I was a buyer. Yeah. And that's the easiest way to learn how booksellers think is the best way to sell books, because they're trying to sell you a book. But I also expressed a lot of curiosity of how they did it and what they were doing and, you know, where did you get that? And I learned about auctions and they were very forthcoming if they liked you. They would share the information. And I wasn't asking them, you know, where do I go and buy the books you want to buy to get them before you do? They knew I wasn't a threat in that yeah. area. Um, so. And that was before, so the booksellers I bought from were the influence before I was. Justin Schiller was a big influence on me because he gave me insights into buying books at auction. I remember he bought me, the first expensive book I bought was a presentation copy of The Hobbit. And uh, Schiller bought it for me in London, this is in the mid-70s, paid Seventeen hundred and fifty dollars or something for it. In her jacket, yeah. wonderful long inscription in Middle English by Tolkien, and um, you know he explained a lot to me about. He was very forthcoming, yeah, as a, and had and had a kind of uh, wisdom about it. So then later, well, I'll leave that alone. But okay. but though, before. Anyone who would talk to me was an influence. Because sometimes it was I'd walk into a bookstore and it was an influence of, this is not the way to do it. Yeah. And that's a big influence. Yeah, knowing what not to do is as valuable knowledge. More. Maybe more valuable than knowing what to do. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So how long have you been um, actually a bookseller rather than a collector? Since 1980. Since 1980. May 1st, 1980, Catalog One went out, turned pro, total slut. <laughs> <laughs> no more books in my collection. Everything had a price on right. it. Right. Done. Done and over. Over. Yeah. Uh, book collecting was the maiden I loved, and book selling was the whore I married. <laughs> um, when you, you're talking about uh, some of those booksellers, uh, I, I think to myself what the world was like in 1980 and what the world is like today. And it's disappointing as a bookseller to see so many open shops closed. Just never to happen again. It's not just bookshops. It's anything that isn't 
a restaurant or a nail salon or a massage parlor or really? they're all going the way of even the department stores I mean Amazon is going to eat the world yeah that's as much. simple as that that's what we're watching go down hmm. and Google but I mean people are order in certain cities you can order groceries on Amazon now yeah I'm not talking about paper towels and Tide no I'm, I'm talking about apples, apples and, and chickens and stuff yeah yeah uh, it's amazing. And anything, and the younger generation are so adept at it. I, I have a granddaughter who's 14 and one that's 12. They enjoy going to the mall. They want stores. Yeah. But, you know, if they want it now, they just go online, click, 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 click. Amazon comes, they're Amazon Prime, so they pay nothing for shipping. The price is usually cheaper because they search until they get what they want at the right price. And if they don't like it, it comes back. No one asks a question, no one's bothered, no one's back, money, good, thing, done. Hmm. And so get in your car, drive to a store, find a parking like a place. Yeah. That aggravation is over with. For the younger generation who don't have an enjoyment of it and don't find something in the experience, there's no reason. And then, you know, there's no reason to go to a store to do something. Me, I prefer it. Yeah, I do. I don't want to buy even a shirt online. I want to try it yeah, on. Right, yeah. Huh? Um, I was going to ask you about uh, your early recollections from when you were uh, began as a bookseller. Uh, you had catalog one. Now, what catalog number are you up to now? Oh, I don't even know. Fifty-two. I'm working on fifty-two. And we do lists also, and we're at list one hundred and two. This list at this book fair is one hundred and two. What about the internet? At first, I remember your catalogs. You had no email. Right, and resisted uh, it. You resisted it for how didn't, long? Didn't want to be bothered by it. Um, since my kids took a more active role in Bibliotopus, once they decided that um, they were going to take a more active role, then the website got pumped, email came in, you know, changed everything uh, uh, maybe not but. well you know it didn't change what I do no no but I do the same old thing if they want something to do they can do anything they want fine go do it you know it's great to have your kids in the business yeah or not <laughs> it is it, 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 it's Jennifer handles my daughter Jennifer handles all of the business side of it that's her domain all the logistics all the organization of books for the book fair and getting them there and all the mailing and but all the paperwork that goes to the CIA to the CPA and all of the um, you know invoices and keeping things in all the business side of it that's her game Alex does the photography he's bought a ton of equipment he's really good at it that was his initial uh, thing and then uh, but now does um, all the book fairs I don't want to do so Alex does London and Boston Alex and Jen both do Boston but yeah. Alex does London every year and and he goes to Florida and he goes to Baltimore and he goes to he enjoys doing it Seattle and he's very skillful and we have a uh, we have a uh, He's made. A, he's got a new new twist on it. So he's got his own take on it. He does it in a way that nobody else does. And so, you know, I let him go. It's a good thing to do. He can do the thing. the 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 hardest thing for a bookseller to have in book selling is ingenuity and creativity. That's really scarce. But the the hardest thing. After that, because you can get along without that. The hardest thing is buying books. Anybody can take orders. You can teach someone to write a catalog, teach them to repair books. You can teach them to do bindings. You can teach any of that. But buying books is something that it's a combination of knowledge, understanding, wisdom, experience, and some inner thing that's undefinable. Right. That's the hardest thing, and some people have it, and some people some, don't. Some people don't, and those that don't aren't going to ever get it. That's right. They're never going to get it. If they're wired for it, you can get it quickly. You'll make mistakes. 
He'll learn from your mistakes. We all do, but and, but he can do it. He can buy books. That's so, as you said. That's the most important thing. Yeah. We've got a couple of more minutes before our next interview, and I just wanted to ask your opinion on where you think the trade is headed in the next five or 10 or 15 years. Uh, are we going to be more of a paper and picture and broadside kind of business, or are we going to be a book business? I think the booksellers are practical. They're going to sell what there's demand for. If they sense that there's a demand for Pez dispensers, you're going to start to see Pez dispensers yeah. at bookstore, book, yeah. book fairs. I want to say something because it leads to that. When I put out catalog one, one of the fears I had was that I wouldn't know if I was on the right path with my catalog or not, unless I had a decent mailing list. Because I could have a perfect catalog and a horrible mailing, mailing list, list and the catalog would fail and I wouldn't know Why? whether it failed. Yeah. yeah. And so I cut a deal with a very well established bookseller. And it was his idea. He'll give me his mailing list and I will give him first crack at everything in catalog one for with a twenty percent discount. Deal. Two. Now I had that problem solved. Right. When Catalog One came out, silver covers, colored pictures, yeah. embossed, blah, 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 he called. We put the catalog, we sent him his catalog, we put the catalogs, the rest of them in the mail, because we put the stamps on ourselves and all yeah, that. Yeah, usually. Dumped them, took them down to the Ottawa Post Office, go. And I said, okay, I'm ready. And he called up and he ordered $10,700 worth of books. The catalog had a total of about 80 grand in it. $10,700 he bought, or something like that. And when I got, a, and it, what that was, was a complete run of the Bond books in jacket, a complete yeah. run of Chandler in jacket, and then a bunch of single books, a Walden and a Scarlet Letter, and you know, I don't know. And uh, I had the re re phone receiver to my ear, and I pushed the button down to get a dial tone, and I picked it up, and I dialed Lawrence Witten, who in those days was the president of the ABA, right. specialist in music manuscripts. But I'd seen him in LA at the book fair and I'd met him and I'd bought a little Melville letter from him and made friends with this. This was a, a fine gentleman with a, even a great lady for a wife, yeah. if you knew Mrs. Witten. Yeah, I did. What a great lady. She was. And he a fine man. And I admired this person so much. And I bought this Melville letter from him for, I think, $3,500. And I saw in his booth, he showed me, which was not his game at all, a second folio Shakespeare hmm. that he had as the second edition of the, right. So I lusted after it. I wanted it so bad because it was an anchor for Bibliotopus of sure. what to say. You know, yeah, there's all these people out there selling these modern books, but, you know, this I'm not that got. guy. Yeah. And uh, it was $10,000. And as I pushed this button down, I dialed up Witten and I ordered that book and he gave me a 10% discount, $9,000. And that Shakespeare came in the mail. And that was the first sale I made as a professional bookseller and the first book I bought. Wow. On that same catalog, I got a call, a telephone call, after the catalog had been mailed, from John Fleming. John Fleming was the Air was the assistant to and then the heir to ASW Rosenbach. Right. I get a call from John Fleming. And he says, Oh, you've got this Hemingway letter, and I've got a customer, it's five thousand. It was the most expensive thing in the catalog, it's five grand. I've got a customer, but he's in the hospital. If it doesn't sell and my customer gets out of the hospital, you know, if it does go ahead and sell it, but if it doesn't sell, plus I really liked your catalog. You ever come to New York? No, no, not, you know, might come for the book fair if I ever get in the ABA. Oh, okay, when you come to New York, you come and you see me, tell me you're coming, I want, we want to have lunch. It's all right, it felt, made me feel great. Four years later, I get in the ABA. I go to the New York book fair. I call John Fleming. And he says, oh yes, and I keep sending my catalogs. Oh, do I, yes, lunch, fine. Gives me his address, come. I said, can I bring my wife and kitties? Sure, bring them, <laughs> Okay, we go. Now, he's got this 
apartment. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And it's a whole floor. And he's got the floor above. And he's blown out the ceiling so he has an apartment with these 25-foot ceilings. Magnificent. Antique furniture from the Philip Rosenbach is the yeah. uh, 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 Albies Rosenbach's brother was a furniture guy. Got the furniture, the thing, the books, the thing, and a stage. This apartment had a stage in it. And then he has this dining room table and all that. Okay, so, you know, and I bring the wife, and I've got my two little kids. And then, so this is 84, so they're 10 and 8. And we have lunch, and he's got French maids, the little costumes yeah. that bring out the lunch and the thing, and the, you know, the the cooked pear and the da -da 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 -da. <laughs> we all lunch, blah, 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 talky, 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 you know, he liked my wife, everything was cool, great man, another, you know, fantastic. And uh, we finished lunch, and uh, I'm getting ready to leave, and he says, um, oh, could I take your children for a moment in the, with me in there? And I said, sure. Yeah. He toddles off with the children. He takes them into, he's got the Rosenbach Children's Library yeah. in there in the apartment. Wow. He lets them each pick a book out. They pick out, each pick out some kind of 18th or 19th century little book with colored, hand colored uh, illustrations and a Morocco box. Yeah. You know, they each have their little precious. Oh, thank you. And then he said, okay, we're going. He says, oh, he says to my wife, he says, would you, could you take the children off and leave him with me? And me, 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 I said, she says, sure. So we go off, sits down, talky-talky. Oh, he says, anything, and he starts to, just what you were talking about at the beginning of our interview, he starts to school me. He says, what are you going to do? How are you going to do this? Oh, I see. And I gave him my master plan, and I revealed yeah. it. He says, it's amazing. I think you'll do great. I think you're, you're pointed just right for the curve of what's coming and thing, and he he made recommendations to me, you know, of what kind of books I should buy. I remember one thing he said was, uh, he says, you know what's really undervalued? He says, half the plays in the first folio of Shakespeare are, appear there for the first time. Those are the real first editions of those 19 mm -hmm. plays. Yeah. He said, buy those when you see them. And I said, how much do they run? He says, somewhere between two and $3,000 a piece. He said, buy those. And I said, uh, you have any? No, no, no. But maybe the next time you come, maybe I'll, 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 if I pick any up, the next time I see you next year, I'll have them for you. So I said, okay. So I had this, now that was a powerful influence. Yeah. Because even though Bibliotopus is nothing like John Fleming's apartment, it is... That was the model. It was you were influenced was by the, model. the way he did things. I have collected antique furniture. I have my I collect Regency furniture, uh, which is kind of uh, 1800, 1830. Um, you know, I have my Picassos and Legers on the wall, my Matisse. You know, the pictures are there, and the lamps are, and everything is done. You know, not replicating what he did, but with that in mind because I saw that and I said, look, this guy's been after it a lot longer than me. He's, got, he's made his mistakes, he's made his adjustments. There's something there. And I came to understand what it was in that presentation that he was doing. It paid off for me. I had it before I understood it, Yeah, which is a wonderful thing. I just wanted to put that in. Oh, you asked me where do I think it's going? We will adjust. We are like evolution a chameleon you know <laughs> will will we got to live you have yeah. to sell to live you have to buy to live you have to, to sell, sell to live, live in our business and we will do it and what you're seeing out there is people's experiments and s most of them are wrong about what they have and right. a few of them are right and the ones that are right will know it you know and will if to the degree that we have the ability to adjust, each of us, to pivot and not get stuck in what we do, we'll sense the market, find our thing, and do what we can. This is a good spot to end this interview. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mark.